This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is brought to you by Mars Horizon Blastoff, a new card game where you play different space agencies racing to land the first humans on Mars. Learn more and help fund their Kickstarter over at aurochdigital.com. So that's A-U-R-O-C-H digital.com. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 348 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Gregory Benford. He's a professor of physics at the University of California, Irvine, and is the author of over 20 novels, including In the Ocean of Night, Foundation's Fear, The Berlin Project, Heart of the Comet, which he wrote with David Brin, and Bull of Heaven, which he wrote with Larry Niven. And we'll be speaking with him today about his new novel, Rewrite, a conceptual sequel to his best-selling novel, Timescape. And today's show is brought to you by the new card game Mars Horizon Blastoff from Oroch Digital. And there's an interesting story behind this game. So Oroch Digital has been working on a video game titled Mars Horizon about different space agencies competing to send humans to Mars. And they noticed that the UK Space Agency was offering grants to anyone who was popularizing the idea of space exploration. And so Oroch Digital applied for and received one of those grants. And so that put them in touch with the UK Space Agency, who gave them feedback on Mars Horizon. And part of that feedback was that it would make a great board game. Now, Oroch Digital had already produced a rough version of their video game design using physical cards just to test out the concepts, but it hadn't occurred to them to release that as a separate product. But so getting that feedback from the UK Space Agency encouraged them to do just that. And so they've been developing the card game into a standalone product titled Mars Horizon Blastoff, and they're currently running a Kickstarter for just around $5,000 to help them finish up the game. And as I said, this game was developed with feedback from the UK Space Agency, including feedback from the UK Space Agency's board game club. And so there are no warp drives here or anything like that. Every piece of technology in this game is something that has been built or has been seriously proposed for getting humans to Mars and making us a multiplanetary species. And Oroch Digital has a solid track record of successfully kickstarting games, including Octung Cthulhu Tactics and Elections of U.S. America Elections. So if Mars Horizon Blastoff sounds like your sort of game, you can learn more and help support their Kickstarter over at orochdigital.com. And again, that's A-U-R-O-C-H digital.com. All right, so now let's get to our interview. All right, so we're here with Gregory Benford. Welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Okay, and so your new book is called Rewrite, and you call it a conceptual sequel to your novel Timescape. So first of all, just tell us about Timescape and how you got the idea for that. Well, Timescape was published 39 years ago, 1980, and so is ancient by definition. Um, And it's basic, actually, on my experience in graduate school, but also the work I had done in in physics on tachyons, uh, I supposed particle that can travel uh, faster than light and therefore backward in time by general relativity. It was a special relativity. I wrote several papers in Physical Review about this uh, when I was a postdoc with Edward Teller, and uh, I was interested in the consequences of suppose you could send information backward in time, just information, not people. Um, and Replay, <laughs> my day's novel, is about sending all uh, re- re- Rewrite. Uh, sorry, Replay. <laughs> I was thinking of Kim Grimwood's novel. Uh, yeah, Rewrite transfers information also, but in the way of quantum entanglement with oneself in a multiverse. Uh, and there I'm stealing the idea from the Everett multiverse model of quantum mechanics, which has now been around for over half a century. So it's all entangled, I might say, with my physics career. So you said that uh, I was amazed to find in one of my first fanzines written at age 14 a two-page story which clearly prefigures the concerns of Timescape? That's true. And it was a very good story, of course. And I wrote it when I was, as I recall, 15 years old and published a fanzine called Void. And the the trick is to realize that the ideas can be stated compactly, but to really play them out in terms of the physics involved and how, how physicists work, which is a lot of what all of my novels have been about, uh, takes time and effort. Uh, as I learned in the several papers I wrote about the idea of backward in time propagation of information, which is still a live issue in physics. Mm-hmm. So do you feel like stories where a person travels physically back in time is less scientific than sending information back in time? 
Well, all of these are not less scientific, but more imaginative and maybe less likely. But uh, after all, we've had electromagnetism for a long time, and so we transfer information with electromagnetic waves. But we still don't transfer people with electromagnetic mm-hmm. waves. <laughs> so I just said, let's do the easy thing first. I, I really started out on Timescape uh, and later on uh, Rewrite by thinking, you know, what would it really be like if you found you could do this? First thing you would do is move information and see if you could make the whole thing work. So uh, uh, Timescape was deliberately written from the point of view of scientists involved. And Rewrite is about a single my person's mind being transferred through quantum entanglement to a, a, a mind of that same person in a slightly different other multiverse in the quantum mechanics sense. Uh, you might say I'm compounding two wild and crazy ideas together. Hmm. Um, so talk about, in time, I think one of the things I think is really interesting in Timescape is that there's this perennial problem in time travel stories called the grandfather paradox, which is if you go back in time and kill your grandfather, then you were never born, but then how did you go back in time to kill your grandfather? And so it's this paradox. So talk about how Timescape uh, deals with that issue. Well, I realized in writing the novel and, and that I did not actually have an ending in mind was that there is a, a quantum mechanical way to look at this. That is, the act of going backward in time is what creates another quantum mechanical universe. Not, as Everett said, just any old thing that happens every time you throw a ball against a wall, you get a different universe. No, instead, something fundamental has to happen, and that fundamental thing was the creation of a paradox that could only be resolved in quantum mechanical language by peeling off another quantum state, which was another universe. So the answer is, you can go back and kill your grandfather, and then you live in the world in which you are there, your grandfather isn't (laughs) alive, and you go forward to something else. The universe you're in, uh, you leave behind. (laughs) So... In that universe, you vanish at some future date and don't ever appear again. Uh, You've gone to the other universe, backward in time, however. Uh, That was the solution I proposed in Timescape. And it turns out that a gentleman named David Deutsch at Oxford later formulated a whole version of quantum mechanics on that insight uh, in the early 1990s. And I've spoken to him about it. He said he, he thought it was a good distinction that the splitting of the wave function, as we say in quantum mechanical language, could occur because of the, the invention of a paradox. And so this gets you around, by the way, the old question of how does the wave function collapse as we see it in our world and become a non-quantum mechanical thing like this phone call, <laughs> for example. <laughs> well, I want to come back to that too, but I, th- I think one thing that's interesting in Timescape is that one of the implications of that uh, of of time travel working that way is that anything you do to try to affect the past, it never affects your world and you never see any evidence of it. You just have to uh, sort of almost take it on faith that you're doing a good deed for the, the greater multiverse. That's true. When you send information backward in time, you're spilling off another multiverse or, or one other quantum mechanical state and you don't get to participate. So there's a bittersweet quality which is what I needed at the very end of Timescape in a long chapter, uh, in which a, 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 this one central character realizes this bitter, uh, sweet truth, which is true in a, in a larger way of the human experience. You can understand the past, but you can't change it. Right. And so you've said that Timescape sold over a million copies. So could you talk about why you think it struck such a chord with readers? I believe... It's sold so widely because it's a real depiction of how scientists work. And I had early on when I started as a hobby, just a hobby while I'm a professor of physics at the University of California, Irvine, to to show people what scientists actually do, how we think, and how it's not really mysterious. It's a kind of a, a very, very careful form of practical reasoning. And then to see what their lives are like, because scientists don't really quite live life the way that other people do, I've noticed. And so <laughs> the way to do it was to show people uh, who are scientists and who have the traits I know uh, many of my friends have. And so there's a lot of autobiography trickled into that novel and a previous, uh, rather later novels, such as Cosm, a novel about a woman at UC Irvine in, in physics. 
Dan uh, Schiller, a novel about cryonics around Orange County, California. And so I'm always using material from my life. I just realized that almost no now, uh, novelists have the experience that scientists do. And so here was fresh ground. I, I didn't have to write the kind of novels that other people were doing. So if you think that there's that sort of hunger for stories about scientists out there, why do you think there aren't more people writing, uh, you know, sort of following your lead on that? I think it's hard to do. Well, I know it's hard to do. <laughs> I think you have to have the experience of doing science, which can gobble up all your time, by the way. I mean, scientists are notoriously uh, hard workers. Uh, if you get tenure at a university in science, you, you, just, you just never give it up. Whereas that's not true in other disciplines. Other people can walk away from, say, the study of history or something. But scientists don't quit, in my observation. So uh, that that quality about them makes them stand out. And after all, you are writing better if you can write about people who are really focused on their lives, not people who just drift through life. Right. It's interesting you say that because, you know, my dad grew up wanting to be a science fiction writer and he studied physics because he thought uh, that would be useful background for a science fiction writer. And then he just got so absorbed in physics, he just became a physicist and, and never, never became a science fiction writer. Really? Well, I did both because I always liked writing. And unlike most people, I find writing a, kind of straightforward. It's a, an organized activity I can do as a hobby. And it's always been a hobby. It's just, I just never thought it would give me so much success at it. Uh, most people aren't successful. Uh, so maybe your your father missed a good opportunity. Where did he uh, do physics? Uh, well, he's at, he was at IBM for most of his career, and now he's at Stanford. Uh -huh. Well, great. Those are good places. I mean, it's good life. I don't regret the fact that I wrote novels, but I didn't have to. I just decided to do so starting or after I'd already gotten my PhD and was, uh, was doing physics in a full-time mode. Well, I, I think you've written something like twenty novels, so that's quite a that's quite productive for a, a sideline hobby. Yeah, it is. I I just learned that if if you rope off some time and you write steadily, it's amazing how much you can write. Uh, the the trick is to not get jammed up. So I only write when I feel like it. If I don't feel like it, I stop. It's like any other thing in life. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Okay, so getting back to rewrite. So um, so you mentioned that the story involves. Uh, mental states transferring through different universes. And so how, the, how that um, instantiates, particularly here, is you have this character named Charlie Moment, and he is in his late 40s in 2002 and gets hit by a car and wakes up in 1968 at the age of 16 and can live his life over again. Um, I guess, is there anything more to say about how that idea came to you? Well, quite some time ago, I, I read uh, Ken Grimwood's novel, Replay, and it was quite fetching. I actually met him once. Uh, and in, in his novel, there's a character who has a heart attack and gets to replay his life and everything. And I, it's kind of ironic that Kim died of a heart attack at the age of 59 in Santa Barbara uh, when he was trying to write a sequel to Replay. <laughs> so he was saying, Replay, Replay. Uh, the other oddity is that uh, we both are from uh, Alabama. And we both came to California to find our fortunes. Uh, he was a very interesting guy. Uh, so I had that background, and I began to think about the possibilities that Replay had not used. So in Rewrite, I write it from the point of view of a guy who's not a physicist. But it, it, where the fun came in for me was I had him go and talk to Everett, which I never did, about Everett's formulation of quantum mechanics. And then later on, he seeks the advice of people like Philip K. Dick, whom I did know, and because Dick had various time theories and so forth. Look at Man in a High Castle, for example, which is a, an alternative history. And, and also Robert A. Heinlein, who was also a friend of mine. So I got to use people I knew who were not scientists in a scientific uh, science fiction novel. So it, to me, it was kind of a playground of ideas. I could fool around with them and see what kind of drama seemed to come out. So th that was a very strong influence for me. And, and some of the commentary on it has noted that I used some of the flame fr frame that Ken did, but I use it differently. Right. I want to come back definitely to Philip K. Dick and Robert Heinlein, but you were talking earlier about 
scientists like David Deutsch have explored some of the the scientific you know aspects of of some of these ideas do you expect or like how likely do you think it is that you might wake up uh in a younger you know in an alternate world or something uh at some point in your existence i think it's very unlikely but there are a lot of things i thought unlikely have already happened so i i i don't try to deal in probabilities uh, i but rather possibilities or which is the core idea of science fiction so uh the, the key idea that I used it was not in, in the other books I've referred to, is that quantum entanglement, a known true ph phenomena in quantum mechanics, can be married to the idea of transferring information into another mind. So when when, when Charlie Moment, an ironically chosen name, obviously, uh, lived, wakes up in another moment, uh, the information of his past is in his mind, uh, but of course, the body didn't transfer. It was just the information that transferred. And that's true in Timescape, too. You can only transfer information, not real things. So, uh, in a way, I was trying to use the quantum mechanical notions to show how they might happen in another way. Uh, I, I don't necessarily believe, well, I don't know, or maybe somebody would involve uh, another formulation of quantum mechanics based on on a rewrite, because after all, Deutsch did that using the ideas in Timescape uh, 39 years ago. So it's a uh, striking coincidence that we have so many uh, ideas that come out in science fiction and are later, later manifest in science and engineering. There are a long list of things that were first seen in science fiction and then later made into reality, all going all the way back to the invention of the tank, for example. Right, that was H.G. Uh, Wells' The Lance Ironclads? That's right, and Winston Churchill read that story in the Strand magazine, and when he, in World War II, he started the research that led to the invention of a tank, like an exact example of a foreshadowing by science fiction. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the, this Charlie Moment character who wakes up in 1968, how autobiographical was that character? Well, uh, Charlie's a movie buff, and so am I. So Charlie says, hey, you know, I'm a history professor. What do I know, aside from history, that, that I could use when I'm back here in 1968? I could hear all that great music again, but what else? And he suddenly realizes that, hey, I can go to Hollywood and I can make the movies that I've always admired before they get got made in my world. So he ends up being the guy who produces The Godfather, for example, and other movies. Um and the first half of the novel is what's it like to be in Hollywood? And it's based on my experience of working with people in Hollywood for 20 years until I finally gave up because I really got tired of those people. Right? <laughs> <laughs> people think Hollywood is a great experience, and maybe it is for some, but after a while I found it frustrating. It was To me, it was just endless uh, script conferences and so on, which were as bad, I discovered, as faculty meetings at the University of California. <laughs> And so these were producers who wanted to adapt your novels into films? Producers and directors, yes, right. I mean, I had uh, options and worked on them with Fox and Universal and Paramount and so on. And I got a bit tired of it. Plus the traffic drive. Just L.A. got worse and worse. Yeah, I lived in L.A. for a couple of years, uh, you know, fairly recently, so I can definitely confirm that that's the case. Yes, and you learned better. <laughs> hey, I'm not there, any, and I'm not there anymore, so... That's true. I've never lived in L.A. When, uh, when I came down to Southern California, the, the big draw was the University of California. Only four years after I got a Ph.D. at the university uh, in San Diego and Laguna Beach, which I've been in ever since. Right. Well, so, yeah, because I, I definitely got the sense from reading the book that you had a lot of experience in Hollywood because it's it's just very well observed, those sections. And some of these conversations uh, with the Hollywood people are hilarious where they say, oh, we should make this character a robot or, you know, what if the astronaut took his helmet off and he could breathe? And the main character says that doesn't make any sense. And they're like, well, but it's science fiction. It doesn't have to make sense. Yes, exactly. You see, everything you quoted actually happened to me. I didn't invent any of that. It was all said to me, <laughs> and it, it is hilarious, uh, and and it's true. <laughs> uh, so it was just too tempting to not use that experience. Plus, but but then halfway through the novel, I realized I can't just make this a Hollywood novel. Uh, Charlie Moment starts to wonder, hey, I wonder if this ever happened to anybody else. 
and he finds out that it did. And that leads in into the whole prospect of how you use this idea of uh, entangled quantum states propagating to an, another past universe uh, to make it yield something. I mean, and, but there are people who are using it to try to affect human history. Uh, and that's what dominates the last half, where the pace kind of picks up, I think, and and it leads to a, a good deal more action, not just more movies to be made. Hmm. Well, but so there are a lot of real people who appear as characters in this book. I mean, so in, just in Hollywood, for example, you have Roger Ebert, Steven Spielberg, and there's a mention of Michael Crichton. Are those people that you dealt with at all while you were there? Well, yes. As a matter of fact, I knew all those people. Roger Ebert I knew through fanzines. I was a science fiction fan as a teenager, and he wrote for my fanzine and I for his. He was a very, very sharp movie guy, of course. And, and I met him several times. Spielberg I met and had some conversations with when I was on the board of the Science Fiction Museum in uh, uh, Seattle. Uh, and Michael Crichton actually taught a course at UCI. I used to have an early supper with him when he was here in between movies trying to make a few extra bucks. Uh, and and he was a very interesting guy, he told me all kinds of inside dope, which, of course, piqued my interest. Uh, and, you know, his original education was as a, a physician, but he found it boring and, and turned to writing books and making movies. Um, he gave up his uh, uh, professional career. I never have given up mine. I've still do physics, publish papers, the whole thing. Uh, the other thing that's in the book, uh, that that's a small gesture in my case, is that I'm also an identical twin. And so my twin appears in the book actually doing what I did in this world. For example, in, in, in Rewrite, my brother Jim Benford, wrote Timescape, not me, and I don't appear in the novel, which is another way of playing with a reader, to say, hey, see, this this universe is somewhat different. Uh, but that's my, my own brother called me up and said, hey, you made me the, the author. I said, yeah, well, it, it was there. I used it. You know, He liked it a lot, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's, that's somewhat plausible, right, because he has a pretty similar scientific background to you. We're very, very close identicals. There are two modes for identicals, very close or very distant, and we're very close. We, we grew up in southern Alabama, and uh, we helped each other, actually, along with our careers. In fact, he and I are just working on a scientific paper right now. We published dozens of papers together. Uh, so, yes, he could have written uh, Timescape. He just didn't. I mean, it was only available to one of us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, although I collaborated with my sister-in-law, Hillary Benford, uh, on portions of Timescape, and she is duly credited in the novel. So, correlations. Hmm. I mean, so the actual line in the book uh, about Michael Crichton is Charlie Moment thinks, maybe I should have pulled Crichton in, but he can't stand the guy? Is that what we're... Yeah, yeah. well, that was not true of me. I, I put that in in order to give Charlie some kind of edgy character. Uh, of course, Crichton is unfortunately dead, so he can't read that. Uh, uh, but so a lot of people didn't like Crichton. I learned, but I like Crichton just fine. He was uh, kind of on my wavelength. I thought he said you should really write screenplays uh, the way I do. It's really exciting. And I said, eh, nah, actual science is actually more interesting. Plus, I like the people better. Hmm. Well, so yeah. So you mentioned also other real people who appear as characters are, are Philip K. Dick and Robert Heinlein. Um, and you said you knew them. Could you talk about how how how, you, how well you knew them? Well, Phil Dick moved down here to Orange County, but I had actually already met him when I was at the, the, living in the Bay Area. I, I met him in first in 1964. Uh, but when he moved down here, I saw him reasonably often, uh, and uh, he, he lived, what, 15 miles away. Uh, and I got to know his vagary. So a lot, uh, a lot of his lines of dialogue in the book, in fact, almost everything he says, are things I heard him say, because we... Uh, we talked about, by the way, his writing a sequel novel to Man in High Castle, and he actually wrote two chapters, which I read, uh, and which are used, by the way, in the TV series now. Uh, Robert A. Heinlein, I, I met in 1968, I believe, or nine, and knew throughout his life. A uh, very interesting guy. He lived in uh, Santa Cruz when I was in the Bay Area. So uh, I enjoyed knowing him, and I was a huge fan. I'd read all of his novels ever since... Uh, the around 1950, and indeed he, he was one of the people who propelled me forward to go into the sciences because he's his depiction of 
of the prospect of the future of science, engineering, everything, was so enticing. And he was uh, my favorite science fiction writer. I mean, Phil Dick was a great SF writer, too. I've, I've known almost every SF writer you, you've ever read. I, in time, you, you get around. <laughs> Is that true about Robert Heinlein overpressurizing his house? Yes, uh -huh, it's true. He overpressured this circular house he built in Santa Cruz so that when you open the door, dust doesn't blow in, it blows out. It's really true. <laughs> um, Has any, anyone else ever done that? or like? I've known several people who've done it, really. It's not hard to do. Just It's just a slight pressure. Uh, uh, plus the fact that uh, overpressuring uh, your house gives you a little more oxygen to run on. Uh, since I have a place also at 8,000 feet, I can tell you there's a big difference in, in your mind's performance versus uh, oxygen available. I mean, Mammoth is uh, has about a third less oxygen in it, uh, because it has a third less atmospheric pressure. I mean, because the depiction of Heinlein in your book, he, he kind of comes across this, this as this almost this like MacGyver-esque action hero. And... I don't know how much of that is because of the, the time loops and so on, and how much of that is just that's the way he was. He was a very practical guy. He had a degree in, in engineering from Annapolis, and he liked doing things himself. He built a lot of his own houses. He invented gadgets. So I just portrayed him the way I knew him. It's, it's not a way you can necessarily see on the surface, but you can certainly see it in the novels. His novels are full of people rigging stuff up and making it work. He loved that kind of thing. Actually, I like it too. Although I'm less good at it. <laughs> and, and you think he was uh, as proficient with firearms in real life as he is in your novel? Well, I saw him fire guns uh, uh, outside his house, and, and he was a good shot, better than me. Uh, I know a few things about guns because I, I grew up around guns and uh, did deer and uh, duck hunting. But uh, he tended to be good at something if he took it up. He would learn everything from scratch and make it work. Yeah, I thought it was just a really interesting – he was a really interesting character in the book. And then you say um, that Philip K. Dick, you say he was one of the oddest people I've ever known. Could you say more about that? Well, I, you know, to me, uh, my world is full of a lot of odd people trying to get even. Uh, and Phil Dick always had an edgy kind of suspicion. It, uh, paranoia dominated his view of the world. He uh, really didn't necessarily trust it, that everything was real yeah, and said so repeatedly. So it was fun to talk to him about that, and he used it to great fashion in his fiction, far ahead of his time, particularly about the, the general phoniness that you get in a world of representations and images. He would have loved the implications of the Internet and virtual reality, which largely did not occur when he died back in, I think, 1982. So at the age of, what, 52, 53, I, I mean, he just he missed... The future that was right there about to happen, and it, it, as I said in an essay about it, uh, no one would have been more surprised by the startling success of Philip K. Dick's fiction in the world at large and his prominence. No one would have been, would have been more surprised than Philip K. Dick. Yeah, I mean, certainly when I was in Hollywood, I felt like Philip K. Dick was the only science fiction author most people in Hollywood had ever read. Well, it's true, if they had read him. Because uh, notoriously for Blade Runner, based on Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, the novel, um, the director read one chapter of the novel, couldn't figure out much about it, and so just stuck to the script. And uh, I, I only learned that later, but uh, Phil didn't know that the director, who entertained him nicely to see some some uh, early footage, um was not actually going from the book at all. Hmm. <laughs> he died happy. He died just a, a short while after seeing those uh, cuts. What do you make of, uh, in the book, you have him tell these stories, like uh, claiming that he could, um, he had an, a period of time where he could inexplicably speak Koine Greek? Well, he said that to me. And he, by the way, he spoke, spoke some German, and so do I. I lived, lived in Deutschland in the occupation. Uh, and we would sometimes speak in German to brush up. And, and then he would lapse into some kind of classical Greek and, that I did not follow. And I don't know whether he was speaking Greek or not. But he said that had come to him in a moment. He could, we could 
phrased these sentences and so forth. They were good examples. I had no way of checking it, of course. I'm not the only person he said that to either. I know Tim Powers reported that to me and Jim Blaylock. Well, it's interesting because I asked Tim Powers about that, and he said that Philip K. Dick, you know, everyone thinks of him as being sort of this crazy eccentric guy, but he said that um, that in his experience, Philip K. Dick would just say odd stuff, and then the next day he would just, you know, not, you know, he's like, oh, that was that's what I was thinking yesterday, but now I'm thinking something else today. Well, yes, he changed his mind his mind about everything. Uh, not a guy to go to for investment strategy, for example. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it's ironic that he died, this fellow who worked later, made millions, and made his children rich. Uh, he died in a what, one- or two-bedroom apartment in Santa Ana, they were, were, which he was paying a couple of hundred bucks a month for. Um, oh, that happens, unfortunately, to a lot of writers. Um, if Phil was a one-of-a-kind, truly a one-of-a-kind, and a lot of fun. He had a great sense of humor. Uh, he, he had a trick of falling out of a chair in such a way that was hilarious. I've never seen anyone copy that either. This was, he did it as a joke? Yes, uh huh. He would do it in various ways, holding a drink. I mean, it was impossible. <laughs> he was also a demon typer. Uh, I mean, I would approach his place in, in Oakland and hear what sounded like a distant automatic weapon, but it was Phil hammering on a typewriter trying to finish a story. <laughs> All right, well, so so getting back to rewrite for a second, I thought one thing I thought was really interesting was that so um, you mentioned that Charlie starts wondering if there are other uh, people who have experienced time travel like he has. And so he, he eventually comes across a classified ad that says, seen the footage of Monaco with the president. Do you drive a Sienna? Colin Powell, a secretary of state, call 201-555-6666. Um, right, right. I think that's pretty, you know, pretty useful. uh Technique, if anyone listening to this ever finds themselves in the past and they're looking to connect with other time travelers, uh, you know, to uh, do something like that. Yes, it took a while to figure out uh, how to run an ad that doesn't give too much away. And, of course, then you use a shared future. You see, the idea is that you can have come backward in time. Uh, I, I, only long after I wrote uh, rewrite, did it occur to me, why are there any stories about people going forward in time? Well, of course, there are Rip Van Winkle kind of stories. But uh, that's, in a way, less interesting. You might as well just set the narrative in the future. Uh, some of the very old 19th century SF works, uh, like Looking Backward, for example, are about people who go to sleep and wake up in the future, stuff like that. So you get to see the future from the point of view of someone uh, at your current time, but that has largely gone away. Uh, I mean, you might say the cryonics stories take the part of that now. You uh, go into cryonics storage and you come out in the future. Uh, I, uh, I wrote such a uh, novel, too, called Chiller, which is about how cryonics really is or was in the 1980s and is much larger now, of course. Well, right. I mean, it's interesting because the first time travel story, H.G. Wells' is The Time Machine, is about going into the future. Yes, but, right. But yeah, it's which going is, into... Which is great, a great way to do it. I mean, you know, he invented it, right? <laughs> Almost. But yeah, but definitely coming uh, traveling into the past is definitely, you know, dominates yeah. time travel stories subsequently. Well, because everyone thinks, gee, if I hadn't done this or I had done that, I mean, uh, revisiting your past and... Well, very often, by the way, rewriting it in your mind is a, is a very common human symptom. And uh, not surprising, actually. Uh, I, I think we're, we're the smartest thing on the planet. And indeed, part of, uh, of that means that we rethink and maybe overthink a whole lot of things. Uh, I mean, that's the key to the quantum entanglement into another uh, multiverse, by the way, that... Uh, the entanglement, which is a great property of quantum mechanics and difficult to understand because it's a prime example of a non-classical idea that doesn't appeal to the intuition. The quantum entanglement uh, between very high density of information states is a very, very complex, powerful thing. And uh, in physics, we've, we've looked at entanglement in simple models, but 
there's no reason it can't be between extremely uh, highly complex things like minds. I mean, you and I have a mind that's roughly a kilogram of uh, wet stuff that somehow does these incredible computations at a at an information density far higher than than computers have. Uh, and how that evolved is a really great subject too, <laughs> about which we don't know a lot. Uh, but these quantum mechanical properties are unexplored so far, and that's one thing that rewrite makes explicit, is thinking about the mind as a quantum mechanical object. Well, so you mentioned um, people like Martin Rees and David Deutsch read this book in draft and gave you feedback on it. What, what sort of uh, opinions did they have about it? They liked it. I mean, Martin uh, is an old friend of mine, and uh, it's always pleasant to get feedback from him. And Freeman Dyson liked it, too. I just did an appearance at UC San Diego with him last week. Freeman is 95 now, and he still reads my novels uh, and does, still does mathematics, by the way. Uh, and he really liked uh, rewrite for its quantum mechanical properties, but he liked even better because he was a character in it. <laughs> novel from uh, what, a year ago, The Berlin Project, which is an alternative history of the Manhattan Project, uh, which was, by the way, called The Berlin Project among people working on it in, in 1940. Uh, but but uh, General Groves decided that was a little too obvious to g give away the the target, so he called it the Manhattan Project because it was set and started in Manhattan. Uh, and uh, so in, in the Berlin Project, we actually get the bomb, as we now know. We could have, if we'd made the right decisions, uh, in 1944, or at the time of the Normandy invasion, which would have really changed World War II, and that's what the I, novel is about. I really enjoyed writing that because, again, I get got to put a lot of people that I personally knew into the novel. I mean, Edward Teller, I was a postdoc for. And uh, lots of other physicists who worked in the Manhattan Project I came to know and uh, know quite well. Now, and I even got to put my own father in it because he was in the Normandy invasion. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it was just terrific to use real people as characters for me because... Uh, well, first, it's it's less work, but you can also kind of make these people come alive again, uh, make them real characters moving through the world again. And uh, that's one of the benefits of getting older as a novelist. You have more material. I mean, more friends. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one of the central ideas of rewrite is that 1968 was this great fulcrum point in history, and that if you could go back to 1968, you could change the world in a way that you couldn't if you went back to 1980 or something. Is that is that fair? Fair enough, because I lived through 68 right at the fulcrum. Uh, at 68, 69, uh, I, I got my doctorate in 67 and moved to the Bay Area. So I was right there when the music was terrific and the times they were a change in, and it was the most tumultuous political year I'd ever seen. Uh, the Tet Offensive, uh, the assassinations of Kennedy and Martin Luther King, which figure in the novel, and all that. And to me, it was a, a, a terrible but also fascinating time. It's, it rings well in memory. So I just used a lot of my experience in that. I mean, I was working with Edward Teller every day of the week in that period, and he, too, was commenting on how strange it was and how different stuff was. Uh, so... Uh, Use your material is always the best uh, material for a writer, I mean. Uh, you tell writers, write what you know. Well, what you come to know is your life and well, everybody in it. Right. Well, so like in the book, Charlie kind of gets involved in radical politics. Did you ever get uh, – have you ever been involved in politics directly like that or sucked into anything like that? I haven't really done anything in politics, but I've read about it a lot. I have a libertarian anarchist sort of bent, uh, so I have my distance from the usual uh, politics. I don't actually do it because I think it's extremely lossy, shall we say. Uh, a lot of thrashing around, not much achieved. Uh, I've always felt that the, uh, uh, well, here I can paraphrase the poet Shelley, who said that uh, poets were the the unrecognized legislators of the future. Actually, I think the scientists and engineers are largely the unrecognized legislators. As, for example, the Internet, which I had much experience with, because I had an email account at Livermore in 1969, 
we didn't call it email then, but that's what it was. Uh, and I watched this whole thing grow up, uh, really a uniquely American set of inventions. Uh, both the computer and the Internet have transformed society in ways that no one foresaw very much anyway. There were some SF writers, like Fred Pohl in the 1960s, foresaw a, a really big information-intense future. Uh, and, and, by the way, it's predicated on cryonics. So uh, I've always felt that uh, that the sciences and engineering are uh, a better way to live. Uh, it's a better lived life. You're closer to the sources of true inspiration and change. Uh, but it also has the advantage of being not just an ideology, but being objectively true. <laughs> well, right. Well, so so speaking of that, I mean, you quote that, that or the Hugh Everett character in the book says, "I'm guaranteed immortality already. My consciousness is bound to each branching. After all, my other selves will follow whatever path does not lead to death, and so on ad infinitum." Uh, what do you true. think about I've, that? Well, I've read the biography of Everett and read, read the interviews with him. I never met him, but he really believed all that. That's why he smoked and drank and had died, had died at a very early age, because he thought there was no point in restraint. What the hell? You're, you're going to live somewhere anyway. So what the hell? Enjoy it. Uh, he was a very strange bird. Uh, and so I painted him exactly as people saw him. Uh, I even listened to recordings of his voice. Uh, uh, fascinating guy. Uh, he really did think he was just going to live on forever, and that we all will in other universes. But you, Maybe that's but not really a consolation. <laughs> but but sorry, so so you don't believe that, or do you? Well, I think it might be true, but I, 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 you know, I have the unusual experience of being an identical twin. So people can't say I can't tell you apart, and I said, yeah, but we can, <laughs> we can. <laughs> uh, so uh, I know that my life is separate from some other self in some other universe I'll never hear about, because to me this is just. Angels on a head of a pen. This is just imaginary people. I don't know if they exist or not, or what saying they exist even means in terms of physics. So I don't uh, find the consolation prize of other multiverses of any use in my life. I don't, I, and I don't recommend it to others. I, I recommend a healthy diet for one. <laughs> and no smoking. Yeah. Get your exercise. <laughs> Eat your pizza. <laughs> well, so so the book is dedicated to David Hartwell and Jerry Pornell. Could you talk about why you chose to dedicate this book to them? Well, David Hartwell was an old friend and, and uh, editor of quite a few of my books. And Jerry Pornell was an inspiring example of a guy who could really get, get things done. He was a writer, but also had two PhDs and did a lot of practical things. And I found them enviable people. And unfortunately, they're both dead. So... I thought they needed a, a head nod in their direction because uh, they were influential to me. And uh, and maybe in another universe, they still exist. Who knows? Yeah, you know, and I, I've never met Jerry Pornell, but I knew David Hartwell pretty well. I used to volunteer for the New York Review of Science Fiction, uh, which oh, right. was at his house. Um, and it was just amazing how much he knew about the history of science fiction. And I would often see him on panels and somebody would say something about the history of science fiction and he would say, no, 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 that's all wrong. And he would correct them. And now that he's not here anymore, it makes me wonder how many, uh, you know, uh, misunderstandings or you know, misconceptions are, are being spread without him there to correct them. Yes, he was a very firm believer in getting the facts right and I miss him too because he knew stuff that just nobody seemed to, to know including me uh, and uh, one of the problems of our field is that there are a lot of uh, the younger characters who have flooded into the field who actually don't know much of his history and get a lot of it wrong uh, particularly in the finger pointing era we're in now they accuse all the older writers of all these social sins uh, uh, many, many times mistakenly they, they actually never knew them, never knew what they were like and what their actual attitudes were. Uh, so uh, a knowledge of the past is essential to plan the future. Did you ever have, I mean, did David Hartwell ever um, you know, make any edits or suggestions for your books that kind of stick out in your mind? Oh, yes, indeed. He was the editor on Timescape. And uh, he suggested I cut out an entire chapter. And I, I first was 
shocked. I said, no, no, this is really essential. And then when I looked at it carefully, I realized he was right, and I took a whole chapter out. Um, and and it sped up the book. Uh, it was kind of ironic because it was one from the point of view of the wife of one of the major characters, and it gave an insight into her. And uh, unfortunately, there were not a lot of women-centered scenes in the novel because they weren't in the lab doing experiments. And so cutting one out meant that it was even more lopsided in that way. Well, but, you know, you have to sacrifice something in a novel. Otherwise, it will overwhelm you. Yeah. I mean, I heard in a, a recent uh, talk you gave, you said that you recently had dinner with Elon Musk. I was just curious to hear more about that. Well, Elon is an old friend of mine. I've known him for decades. And uh, every once in a while when I'm in the area, I'll send him an email. He says, come over, have dinner. At his place on the top of the hill in Beverly Hills, and uh, it was, as always, a really informative one. Uh, the the principal furniture is made from rocket parts. I mean, the dinner table has two uh, nozzles for the end of uh, a SpaceX rocket uh, as these the two holders on and above. Uh, on top of it is a thick transparent glass uh, that was left over from one of his buildings, and. Uh, and there, there's tech ornaments on the walls and so forth. And so it's, it's a palace of technology. Uh, and I always like seeing it uh, move and change around because he changes things occasionally. Um, there will be a bunch of plumbing from a, from a, a fuel pump, for example, uh, anchored on the wall. <laughs> um, and the art on the walls is ever-changing, and it's mostly astronomical photographs of very high resolution. So every time you look, it's a different view. And, of course, the view out the windows is great, too. But Elon's a guy with lots of ideas and lots of innovation uh, always about to come about. And so we would talk about possibilities, particularly the the Hyperloop, which he's planning to build the first major one in apparently Texas. He finds Texas more hospitable to such matters than California which is why he's building more stuff in other places, particularly Nevada. Because of regulations? Regulations, cost of real estate, availability of people, everything's easier uh, because California is a very, very pricey place. Yeah. So it was, they're planning like that, and we talked about other possibilities, how to get to Mars, what to do when you get there, what's worth studying on Mars. I, I worked on some on the possibility of underground life on Mars, which I think is the most probable place to look for life in the solar system other than Earth. Hmm. Um, because uh, Mars had a long era of hundreds of millions of years when it was warm and wet, and it could have evolved life, which would, as it did here, go underground. But it could, here it went underground because oxygen in the atmosphere finally drove it down. But on Mars, it would have reached you from the lack of atmosphere and water into the inner part of the, of the planet, as is true on Earth. So that's the place to look for the original Martian life. But NASA is resolutely not doing that. Uh, mostly because NASA's Mars exploration is driven entirely by geologists. But what people are interested in Mars is biology. Because you've been involved with private space efforts, right? I have, not in any really practical way, as an advisor and several different things. Uh, and, of course, I wrote a novel, The Martian Race, about discovery of subsurface life on Mars and the fact that it might have evolved in a very different way than than ours has. Uh, so, yes, I've thought about this for a long time. I was on the uh, Jet Propulsion Lab advisory panel, well, white paper panel, uh, that constructed uh, a stage plan of how to explore Mars and how to put assets in place so that when humans arrive, they've got something to work with, things like that, way back in the 1990s. Um, a program which was, of course, duly noted and forgotten. <laughs> I may be misremembering this, but did you and your brother not have some sort of effort to do a solar sail or something like that? Oh, yes, right. We did the first experiments in beamed uh, sails, that is, how to power light aircraft with beams, which saves you from carrying a rocket engine along. And we did the experiments first at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. We were the first people to lift a light sailcraft, we call it, carbon fiber, um, against gravity using just... Uh, electromagnetic beams, microwave beams, uh, and showed that you could do it. 
and discovered some new physics doing that, some new engineering too. And then I uh, got, further got a NASA grant uh, to do work in my laboratory at UC Irvine. Uh, in which we looked at the performance and the stability of sails under beamed power uh, for several years and uh, published all of that, of course. And now the Breakthrough Initiative, uh, funded by the great Russian billionaire <laughs> Yuri, uh, uh, is is spending $10 million a year on such research. And my brother is a consultant for them full time. I didn't have the time to devote to it, but he did. And they're looking at methods of driving very light spacecraft with beams, the ultimate target being a flight to the nearest star, Alpha Centauri. Uh, so that's ongoing. I mean, the Breakthrough Initiative is definitely doing that uh, and will play out its guaranteed funding for 10 years. So they're going to produce something. I don't know what. Uh, the, the idea is that it's just economic to build a beam that can power a lot of spacecraft. Uh, and for the same reason it's good idea to build railroad tracks. Uh, and then you can run as many trains as you want on them, uh, and you don't have to do anything new. Um, the the real problem with chemical patrol, propulsion is that you have to carry all this fuel along. Get rid of that, and it must, becomes much easier to send out exploratory vessels. Relic, right, like I watched a talk that you gave where you were talking about how some of the asteroids have enough platinum to cancel the national debt, things like that. It's true. There's an enormous amount of known metals of high value and rare earths, by the way, which are by definition rare, that we could get out of the asteroids. And eventually we're going to run out of those things in the crust of the Earth. In fact, some some things like rare earths are very rare now and present only in a few places. It would be really good to be able to haul those uh, assets home. Uh, you don't have to bring the whole asteroid. You can mine it and ship the good stuff to us. That's an industry I think is is inevitable just because it was, we we already know it's there we can see it uh, and we can go get it robotically I think the future of space lies almost entirely in robotics but it will be almost certainly I think telepresence robotics in which the complicated work and tasks are engineered and followed by by humans operating. Uh, at remote in order to do these things. You don't have to have advanced uh, robotic, robot, uh, human-like robots to do these things. You can have the humans do all the thinking and sitting at home. And that's a, an industry which I feel will certainly be well-developed in the second half of this century. You've also been involved, haven't you, with sort of life extension technologies? Well, yes, I started some biotech companies, which just this uh, last year deployed its first uh, uh, supplement, which does definitely halt the decline in Alzheimer's patients. We showed this in a human trial at Hogue Hospital. It is is not a cure for Alzheimer's, but we were able to show over a period of years that people who take this substance twice a day do not decline in their abilities. They don't recover much, a little bit in memory, but it stops them going downhill. And that's the outcome of a whole lot of genetic research. Based on another thing I did, which with a co-author, I uh, I bought the longest lived animal model in the world, Methuselah flies, they're called. And from that genetics, we found out things about human repair that others do not know. So that's proceeded well. It's uh, from a Let's see, the, the, the company, Genesiant, is 12 years old now. How long before some of those things reached the market? Well, it has reached the market in the sense of the supplement I talked about, which is called Rebuilder, sold by a spinoff company called Genere. Genere Rebuilder. You can buy it on Amazon right now, or you can go to the Genere Rebuilder site and uh, buy it directly from them. Uh, it's um, this... This uh, combination of molecules that we believe, I personally believe, upregulates human repair genes. Because the, the problem of aging is the problem of repair. I mean, uh, when you're 15 years old, your body can fix almost anything that goes wrong. Uh, and subsequently, you, your risks of disease are extremely small. But then we lose that ability as we age for reasons that are known to evolutionary biologists. Uh, 
And the way to extend lifespan is to perk up your repair mechanisms. And only very lately have we at Genesian and others at other places found out what the, some of these mechanisms are, sometimes not in great detail, but we have learned at Genesian how to build them up, how to, how to support them and make them work more efficiently, and therefore perhaps extend the human lifespan. We know that they do extend animal lifespans in the lab because we've done those experiments. So the way to longevity is uh, better repair work. I might add that that's really the deep reason that exercise is so good for longevity, because exercise imposes a little bit of damage on the body every time you do it, and the body has to fix it. Well, you're prompting it. You're, it's like giving the body a vaccination every day, uh, because the response of the body is to up its repair mechanisms, and that will reduce your chances of disease. What is your current thinking on cryonics? Because I know you've been a proponent of that. Well, I am. I think it's a nice backup. I think the chances of it succeeding are very small, but they're not zero. That's the important part. And so I uh, I have a cryonics contract with Alcor Corporation and have now for over, two, well, what is it, almost three decades. Um, because, uh, let's put it this way, you're dead already. And then you're frozen at some temperature. And if in future they figure out how to bring you back from that and fix you up, then there you are. You reemerge into some future. Uh, I think it's a risk. Well, it's not a risk. You're already dead, right? But it's an expense worth taking because it's not that expensive. Um, the weirdness, since I know a lot of science fiction writers, is that uh, many of the SF writers you know were offered a free freeze and turned it down. Writers such as Arthur C. Clarke, Robert Heinlein, Isaac Asimov, Ray Bradbury, Fred Pohl, uh, they all turned it down, even though they had many of them written about it. Uh, there was something strange there that I don't understand. Well, uh, I didn't say no. I just wrote a check and have the contract. Um, let's put it this way. I wrote an essay about it, which concludes by saying, whatever the chances are, and they're surely small, it is the one thing I can think of, aside from a religious faith, that allows you to die with hope. I mean, might the risk be that I mean, you mentioned that, um, you know, succeeding generations have a tendency to judge preceding generations rather harshly. Do you think that they might just bring you back just to put you on trial for, uh, you know, being an awful person? Um, and they don't have a statute of limitations. <laughs> well, I mean, who knows what what the future might be like, right? Well, who knows, but I would like to find out. I mean, so what's the worst they can do to you? They can kill you, but you're already dead. <laughs> so <laughs> where's the downside here? Yeah. So uh, did you have, I guess, do you have any other thoughts on why people like Heinlein or, you know, Clark? Turn turn that down? Um, Heinlein said to me, how do I know it won't interfere with my next stage? You see, he really believed there was a next stage of some kind. Uh, Asimov said to me, I don't think I should impose any kind of cost on the future, even the cost of just topping up my nitrogen. And I said, well, you've already paid for the cost of typing it up. That's what the money's for. He said, still, I don't, I don't think I have any right to have a hand in the future. Um, Bradbury said to me, um, well, gosh, what about my wife and children? I'd lose them. And I said, well, first, Ray, when you came into this world, you didn't know anybody either. But more to the point, what stop you getting a contract for your wife and children? <laughs> he plainly wanted to dismiss the subject. In fact, that's really the reason I think most people turn it down, including SF writers. They don't want to concretely think about the problem of death. That's right. true of almost every. <laughs> right. I mean, but you said you thought it was maybe like one in a thousand chance of, uh, of yeah. being successful. Yeah. And that's just a guess. There's no real way to calculate it. But uh, but one of the thousand is is qualitatively different from zero. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right, so so Greg, we're pretty much out of time. So do you have any just final thoughts, or are there any other projects you're working on that you want to let people know about? Um, well, I'm always working on my next novel. I just finished several months ago the concluding novel of a three novel sequence I did with Larry Nevin. Uh, the novels were Bowl of Heaven, Ship Star, and the third one we just delivered is Glorious. 
and we're at the moment trying to getting together the the proofs and the galleys and all that. I'm hoping it'll be out this year, glorious, and it will conclude the three novel sequence about the discovery of enormous objects in space. Big fun topic, a lot of fun to to work with Larry on. Uh, and uh, glorious will either appear this year or early next year. Uh, that future sounding day 2020 wow 2020 <laughs> that's the future well it's coming up pretty fast and soon enough it will be a bug on our collective windshield <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'll just mention you know larry niffen was my dad's favorite science fiction writer when i was growing up so i've read a lot of larry niffen and i think he's great so i think that's 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 great you were able to work with him yes it's a real treat i've known larry since 1965 he's always fun always full of ideas uh and uh and it's a really great to work with him because he and I started kicking this ideas around for this this book, starting with Bowl of Heaven, fifteen years ago, and it's taken this this long to figure it all out and write the books. But it's been fun along the way and uh it, it's a fun way to think about the, the human prospect, write science fiction. It makes your man mind expand to the true dimensions of the problem of our future, which is of course enormous and always larger than what the previous generation expected. I guess I'll also just mention there's another book that came out recently uh, by George Slusser uh, called Gregory Benford, Modern Masters of Science Fiction that I read in preparation for this interview. So if people are interested in, in you and your work, uh, that's another thing that came out recently. Oh, right. How did you like it? I, I found it interesting and it really intense to read because it's very different to read about your work, which I haven't done much of. Uh and because it all calls up in in my mind all the things I was thinking of when I was writing. You see, I, I live on the other side of the work. I I always remember all the choices I didn't <laughs> make when I was writing a book. And Slusser goes through this in great detail. Alas, he died shortly after writing that book. Uh, what did you think of it? I mean, I agree. It's a very sort of um, it's it's an acad. I mean, it's an academic book. It's from an academic publisher, and it draws a lot of connections between your work and Huckleberry Finn and. Um, you know, Voltaire and things like that. So, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a work I thought of a vast erudition. Um, and, oh, yes. uh, I have, I've not read any of the galactic center novels. So it was interesting for me to, um, you know, to just kind of get a synopsis of those and, and hear about your ideas of, uh, intelligences made out of clay or made out of, uh, magnetic fields and plasma, things like that. I thought was really interesting. Right. These are all ideas that occurred to me just because of my scientific career. Uh, and George was, was very aware of that. Terrific guy. Uh, and, uh, yes, it's, it's very strange to read about my own work in, in an intense way because, as I said, I live on the other side of the border and, uh, it's, it's, uh, enlightening to see what people find. Some things they find, I agree, is there, but I was not aware of it because I'm always trying to use my unconscious as much as possible in order to avoid extra labor. <laughs> uh, I, I think one of the great distinctions about people uh, is whether they've learned to use their unconscious to solve problems. I use it every day. I mean, consciously. I I review all my the, uh, things I'm working on just before I go to sleep. And when I wake up in the morning, I don't open my eyes. I lie there and recall what I was working on. And about one time in three, there's an idea there for free. And it almost always works. And it's been produced by your unconscious, which has still been working while you were asleep. I, I once asked Marvin Minsky, who, who was one of the great figures in artificial intelligence, uh, if, if an AI had to have an unconscious. And he stopped and stared at me and said, I never thought of that, that before. We're always thinking about the conscious intelligence, but we evolved with an unconscious. Why? And... I regard that as one of the great unanswered questions about what it is to be human. Uh, why do we have a real functioning unconscious? Uh, and why can't we access it? Uh, those are big puzzles. Uh, and uh, they're just an example of something everyone experiences. And yet, in my experience, almost nobody thinks about. Yeah, well, I mean, there's certainly there's a lot of mysteries in the world, and I certainly I don't have the answers to those. But I'm glad that there are people like you out there, uh, you know, on the cutting edge of all this stuff, uh, you know, enlightening us. Well, it's enormous fun, and and it is important to keep pointing out the things we don't know and 
almost by consensus, agree to not even recognize. That's a powerful clue in itself. And it's one of the reasons that people are increasingly drawn to science fiction, I think, is because increasingly we know that the future will be determined by our science and technologies, and we'd better be aware of that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a good note to end on. So we've been speaking with Gregory Benford about his new book, Rewrite. So, Greg, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. It was terrific fun. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to Gregory Benford for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to everyone who's given us five stars on iTunes, including Vin Nagel, who writes, The best interview podcast out there. I listen to a lot of interviews where the interviewer hasn't read the author's work and isn't familiar with who they are. David spends a lot of time learning about each new guest, often catching them off guard with insightful questions. A good example of this is in the Casual Ishiguro episode. By the end of it, the guest is engaged in asking questions back at David until his handler has to pull him away for the next interview. In terms of interview-based podcasting, you won't find a better option than Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. So, big thanks again to Vin Nagel for that great review. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. I also want to thank Oroch Digital for sponsoring today's show. Help kickstart their new card game, Mars Horizon Blastoff, over at ORACDigital.com. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit GeeksGuideShow.com. To learn more about your host, visit DavidBarrKirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.